the growth is left in things like particularly photovoltaics where it's one tenth of one percent of our energy mixed today but is growing so fast that in 20 or 30 or 40 years it will be significant. It's critical to say that it will be insignificant in the next 10 to 20 years and its significance will be of a long-term proportion, not a short-term proportion. The best way to start, I think, is to look at oil first because it's the largest and because it's the most impactful on our lives in the very short term. It's not going to surprise you, I think, that we are running short of oil geologically that we cannot find as much as we did uh, 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. This is true of many other natural resources. The world is not really designed for 7 billion people, and particularly since it's 7 billion going on 9 billion. So what we have here is a tightening of oil supplies there are, by the way, there are some oil companies that say, no, we don't want to admit that there's a tightening of supplies. So effectively, Exxon says that there is no uh, tightening of supplies ahead and there is no peak oil ahead. It's very difficult for them to maintain that. It must be a terrible effort because they have not been able to advance their production for the last nine years. And so the first question would be, if there is so much oil and you're out there actively looking for it, why can't you find more? But when you reach a point where the new f discoveries are just able to cover the losses of production that you sustain from what is called depletion, which is the ending of this gas pressure that drives the oil out, that is when you have an equality of, of oil, uh, new oil coming on stream with old oil leaving the scene, you then reach a plateau in oil production. That's what the United States reached in 1970. So this is not a new phenomenon, and it's called peak oil, not surprisingly. But still, I don't think the difference between 215 and 220 is a great one for most of us because the things that are going to happen after that peak are pretty well written in stone. For instance, we're going to have to move to smaller cars. Well, what would make you think that we would like smaller cars? Mother Nature doesn't care. She will give us less oil and we can do with it what we want. I would be I would be worried if we don't know that it's coming and I would be worried if, if it hit us very hard because we have had now 10 so-called energy crises in which suddenly we've had serious cuts in our supply of gasoline and diesel and in nine of those cases, of the last ten, we've had a recession that followed, or something that passed as a recession. And I think it's telling us something, which is that the suddenness of this, the change in patterns which have to be made and which cannot be made overnight, the change in how we spend our money, particularly for things long-lasting things like cars and homes tell us that we shouldn't be taken by surprise with all of this and that we should be expecting it along the route and we should be planning to live with it because it's going to be a future that's imposed upon us as again as I say by mother nature 
we've run through one of the main uh, cheap energy, uh, cheap material things in our lives, and we're going to be running short of many more in the next ten generations. It's something we've never experienced as human beings, but now we're at a point of seven and eight and nine billion that we have to expect them. I'm, I'm sending some kind of a thematic message, which is this problems, these problems are not really answerable where you have a long, long wait before you put, and you put the money in and then it takes you a long time to finally come out with an answer. And we're not going to have any short-term relief from this. We are going to invo be involved in an energy-tight society, I think, for the next 10 to 20 years. And I think on the other side of it, there is relief. And I think we'll come through it. And I think our grandchildren will not be so constricted as we are. But I think we're, we're going to pay the price of our overindulgence from the 60s onwards. <coughs> from 60s to the two tens, and that 50 years from 1960 to 2010, we really fiddled while Rome burned. And uh, uh, some of you uh, know that I, I was uh, a part of that attempt to warn the public and attempt to warn the automobile industry of what was coming. And it's all set out in the first chapter of The Reckoning by David Halberstam, if you're ever in the library. Uh, the first chapter is called Maxwell's Warning. And um, it is true that uh, there have been many people saying this, but you know, the world is full of self-imposed gurus, people that come and say, oh, well, this is a terrific problem. That's a terrific problem. No, I want you to concentrate on this other problem. And half of these things don't take place. And it's very hard for the public to know which is right. So in an educated democracy, you just have to hope that somebody is getting through on some of these things. And I think that now suddenly I have credibility because I've been warning about this before and we've had these terrible energy crises. But now I'm saying that because we haven't done very much, we're going to have a more or less continuous energy crisis from about 2015 to about 2025. And then we'll very slowly get relief back up into the 2030s. But I'm still saying that I don't think that life will change in America. I think it will be a very attractive place. We just have to keep our spirits up and realize that it's something we have to go through. And it's endemic in democracies that everybody can't be informed about everything all the time. It's just part of the price of having a democracy. We have, for instance, big surpluses of natural gas coming up. If we could convert that natural gas to liquids, and they're working on it hard in Dow over here in Midland, and they're working hard on it in DuPont in the East, and there are other organizations that are working on it around the world, like Shell, that would be one way out. Unfortunately, gas is not uh, used very much in transportation. We don't use it in our cars or our trucks. We don't use it in most marine uh, applications. We don't use it on the railroads. And that's going to be one of the big conversions of the next 10 years. But it'll take years and years and years to get any proportion of that working uh, in, the, in, the, in the other transportation side. Of course, it's much too heavy, these big uh, barrels that hold it much too heavy for aviation use. So it's not a problem. The aviation is just never going to be used. But we will turn a lot of our, our we, we'll have little cars that will use compressed natural gas. And we'll have big trucks that will use uh, frozen gas, LNG, liquefied natural gas. And again, they will gradually take the strain off, off gasoline. But it will take years before they're a, a proportion of the whole, in the same way it's going to take years before electric cars begin to reduce our use of gasoline. 
When you get to geothermal, it's too small to make a difference. When you come to wind, it's not very practical to tell you the truth in most cases. Probably along the lake here, you probably can use some wind um, vanes that would do well. But in an awful lot of places, it's marginal. That is the cost of putting up the machines and servicing them and the bother of, 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 of their operation and, and the fact that you have to build coal burning capacity behind them in case the wind doesn't operate in hot summer days, which is all often true. You have to then turn to the coal capacity to, to turn on. These things make wind very marginally economic. But photovoltaics, solar power looks wonderful. And you have a lot of interest around here because you have plants that make it, the solar power, and solar instruments, and that, that's going to be a great growth industry. But all together, all these things, including hydro, come to about 5% of the world's uh, energy requirements. So even if you double or triple it, it isn't going to be enough to solve the problem of the retreating oil. And we can't expand the hydro at all. It's, uh, it's now pretty well fixed, and I think as you all understand, the next big problem is going to be the availability of water. So uh, it doesn't look as if we will have any hydro power increases at all in the next 30 years. And I think between natural gas and, and energy efficiency, we will blunt the worst effects of what is coming. But we will feel it. We will feel it. And, uh, and, and I think one of the most worrying things about it, and I want to share this with you as a final series of points because I want to get to questions which I know you will have, Looking back on ancient Greece, this is the only other great experiment in democracy. The Greeks started democracy about uh, 500, a little bit before, maybe 520 BC, and it cut out around 320 BC, so about 200 years. We're about the 250-year mark, but it's still within range. We don't want to have our democracy end in the way the Greek democracy ended. They, the Athenians, who were the main democrats, they lost a war, the Peloponnesian War, that denuded them of most of their treasury money, and they became impoverished they lost the use of their big silver mines up at Mount Lorien, which became exhausted. For them, silver was like oil was for us. And as they exhausted themselves, they didn't have that supply anymore. And then they lost their fleet, and that had been paid for by huge amounts of, of tax money collected, and many people went into debt to get the money. And now the debt was widespread. I mean, this is so laughably like us that you have to guess that this is a repeat of human nature. And then they became gridlocked in their policy debates. What, what are we going to do with this? Half the people said it should be, we should move this way, and half the people said we should move that way. And they couldn't come to a decision. And they were drifting and in trouble. And in that situation, they decided to that the only thing to do was to go to a one-man rule. Back to the tyrants, as they called them. Back to somebody who could make the decision. Uh, and uh, hopefully an intelligent man. But, but the Greek citizens giving up the power to make that decision so that it could be made for the state as a whole. And once they did, that power was solidified in one-man rule. And it went from one man to one man as it often does, and they never re never retrieved their democracy. 
Now I must say in the case of the Romans they had the same kind of emergencies. They brought somebody like Cincinnatus back to lead them to victory and then Cincinnatus said, are we finished? And they said, yes, we finished. Victory, O Caesar. Well, Caesar wasn't around then, but O leader. And then he went back to his plow. But this is unusual and very Roman. People don't go back to their plows now. And this is how democracy comes to an end at least historically speaking this is how it comes to an end so we're going to have to be very vigilant here this is going to be a countrywide dilemma energy there's going to be huge debates about how we should get out of it you know was the invasion of Afghanistan really an attempt to provide us with future energy supplies I think to some small degree yes but I think the invasion of Iraq was far more more potent along those lines. I think it may be that future historians say that they, this is petroleum war number one. I hope we don't have any more petroleum wars and we're going to have to be, again, vigilant citizens to watch this. This is a kind of a thing that upsets the country and puts it on edge and puts it in opposition, one region against another, one party against another, one class of, of, of economics against another economic class. And uh, it's not that, it's not a, a, a problem that can be solved that way. It is not a problem that civil war will ever, ever bring an end to. It's got to be done by compromise and it's got to be done by education. There's an awful lot of what passes for a philosophy about energy that is not fair or not true and we have to continue to seek the truth. So in that wise and on that note I'll end except to say that um, we now have questions and you have to decide whether the answers are that truth or not. Thank you.